Um, today, so far, we've been talking about the importance of macular pigment. So I'm going to talk about ways to measure it in vivo, that's in the person, that's in your patients. So um, just a brief overview about what we've been discussing. Macular pigment um, is important. It has the anatomic location. It's located in the fovea, uh, which is responsible for all your fine detail central vision. Um, it's a blue light filter um, and an antioxidant, which can help prevent age-related disease. So the, why should we measure macular pigment? So as we've discussed, it could be a potential predictor for risk of AMD. Now with the human and economic impact of AMD in the world, which will be increasing with the increasing life expectancy, um, why not be able to reduce somebody's risk of this disease? Also, there's an influence on visual function and visual comfort from macular pigment. Um, studies have shown that vision under low light conditions and also glare conditions have improved with augmentation of macular pigment. So there's several different techniques to measure macular pigment in the person. Um, all these techniques are very different, but as Shoba was talking about before, it's important to be consistent with how you measure macular pigment. Um, so psychophysical measurements uh, require subject input. Um, color matching and motion photometry have mostly uh, gone out the window. Heterochromatic flicker photometry have superseded those um, and customized heterochromatic flicker photometry as well. Physical methods um, require minimum subject input. Um, some people call them optical methods and, um, or sometimes objective, but we like to call them physical methods. There's Raman, uh, resonance Raman spectroscopy, fundus reflectometry, and fundus ref, uh, autofluorescence. And I'm gonna be discussing some of these techniques with you today. So the first one I'm going to discuss is customized heterochromatic flicker photometry. Um, and I'll discuss, we use a, a research model called the macular metrics densitometer, but there's lots of clinical devices out there on the market. There's a few downstairs um, in the exhibit hall for you to view, ask questions about. Um, so for this one, subjects are required to make isoluminance matches between a blue and a green wavelength. Um, with our device, the the target will appear flickering until that isoluminance match has been made. Uh, it'll there, then appear still to the, to the subject. And uh, we take that radiance measurement of the blue and we calculate the log ratio of the radiance absorbed, uh, the radiance of the blue light absorbed at the macula to a peripheral reference point. Um, and then these are some of the devices this is our research device. Um, this is its baby brother, which is a more clinical, easier to use, faster. Um, and this is the MPS, which is also downstairs. Some of the pros and cons of this technique. Um, it's been fully validated. Uh, we take this technique as the standard that we um, compare other devices to uh, and use in our own research. Um, it accounts for ocular media absorption and scatter by use of that peripheral reference point. So if, you have, if your patient has cataracts, it doesn't matter. You'll still get an accurate measurement. The device is relatively inexpensive, especially when you compare it to um, the, a lot of the optical devices. And there's no need for pupil dilation. Um, unfortunately, this method can be very lengthy depending on the method you use. Our method, which is very particular, can take up to 30 minutes. Um, and also, it's difficult for some subjects to do, especially children, really old people, people with memory deficiencies. Um, resonance Raman spectroscopy, it takes advantage of the car carotenoid's ability to exhibit Raman scattering. So we send in a wavelength of light, and when the wavelength of light hits the molecule, the carotenoid, it sends back a, a different wavelength that's very specific to the molecule. And this light can then be analyzed Fundus autofluorescence exploits um, the lipofuscin um, in the retina. So lipofuscin is a fluorophore that's located in the retinal pigment epithelial down here. Um, it's excited at a certain wavelength with peak excitation between 490 and 510, and it emits an autofluorescence um, 
that peaks between 590 and 630 nanometers. Now, macular pigment absorbs um, between 400 and 550 nanometers with peak absorption at 460. And macular pigment is located anterior to the retinal pigment epithelial. Therefore, if you send in excitation light, uh, if it's within the wavelength that is absorbed by macular pigment, it'll be absorbed before it reaches the RPE and before it reaches the lipofuscin. Therefore, the, um, the emitted autofluorescence of the lipofuscin will be attenuated by the macular pigment. So the device we use in our lab for autofluorescence is the Heidelberg Spectralis HRI plus OCT. It's a confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope. It uses dual wavelength autofluorescence. So what this means is it takes two images at the same time. Um, we actually take a 30 second video which takes about 300 images. Um, and it takes it in a blue wavelength and a green wavelength. And you can see here that with macular pigment, the blue light is attenuated whereas the green is not. So it takes these two images, um, well, it takes about 300 of them like I said, and then it aligns, um, aligns and averages each of them. And then you can see here, we have this dark spot in the middle, that's where the macular pigment's located. And then you can subtract the two images and you get uh, the amount of macular pigment you have in your eye. Um, and this is what the output of that device looks like. You can see you get a full spatial profile um, across the retina. Um, the pros of autofluorescence is it only takes several minutes to perform little subject compliance and provides a full spatial profile as I was just showing. The cons is that the, the device itself is very expensive um, and it requires pupil dilation. Uh, subjects are exposed to bright levels of light and the effects of uh, ocular media is unclear. However, we're thinking about starting a, re a research project that investigates the effects of cataracts on the spectralysis autofluorescence method to see if there is an effect. Uh, there are several ways to measure macular pigment using fundus reflectance. Now reflectance is the quantitative, quantitative measurement of light reflected off the fundus. Um, now you can either do a comparison of light reflected at the fovea to a peripheral point and you can use either, sing well, on the market, there's either single wavelength or dual wavelength reflectance devices available. However, the problem with a single wavelength reflectance device is that there's no way for it to take into account any media opacities. Um, or you can do a spectral analysis of the reflected light using a broad spectral range. The pros and cons are much like the other optical method, the autofluorescence method, um, fast measurement time, little subject compliance, um, and provides you with a full spatial profile instead of just specific points like heterochromatic flicker photometry does. The cons, again, the device is expensive, requires pupil dilation, subjects are exposed to bright levels of light. Um, with this method, there's also many uh, assumptions and mathematical models, and the mathematical models often contain a lot of free parameters. Um, and there's a need to control for intraocular light scatter by use of these mathematical models. So I'm going to go over some of the research that we're doing um, in Ireland. Um, so the, the first study I'm going to talk about is we were comparing three devices um, for macular pigment measurement values. Um, and these three devices were the densitometer, which, is, which uses customized heterochromatic flicker photometry, the Heidelberg Spectralis, which uses auto, dual wavelength autofluorescence, and the Zeiss Visucam, which uses single wavelength reflectance. Um, and all these devices very different um, fundamentally in their methods, so we weren't expecting too great of um, concordance. Uh, but this is what we saw when we compared the densitometer to the spectralis. So this is CHFP versus autofluorescence um, at several different eccentricities. And you can see at the um, most central eccentricity, 0.25 degrees eccentricity, uh, we had very good concordance between the devices. Um, now this concordance has not been pub uh, this strong of concordance between macular pigment measuring devices has not been seen um, comparing devices that differ so much, um, which is important because optical devices may be easier than using an HFP device. 
Um, and it also gives that full spatial profile, which may be good for research. Um, this is the Zeiss VisuCam versus the densitometer. So it's reflectance versus HFP. Um, and you can see here, no subjects measured above 0.5 um, optical density units using the VisuCam, uh, whereas some subjects reached almost a full log unit on the densitometer. Like I said before, single wavelength reflectance is already flawed, um, and that's what the VisuCam uses. So in conclusion, we believe that the spectralis could be used uh, in a clinical setting, also in a research setting, whereas the VisuCam should not be used, um, nor should a single wavelength reflectance device for the measurement of macular pigment. Um, the next thing I looked at was the spatial profiles that were given by each device. Now, a typical macular pigment sp spatial profile um, peaks in the center of the fovea here, and we get this peaked mountain. Um, but there has also been atypical profiles of macular pigment discovered, um, some that have a central dip in the center, such as a volcano, or a secondary peak at the side. So I compared the spatial profiles given between, from the densitometer and the spectralis, um, since their macular pigment measurements values correlated so well, I wanted to see if they also showed the same, same shapes. Um, so the concordance between the two devices um, was in 80% of subjects. Uh, the spectralis showed more atypical profiles than the densitometer. So this is what a typical profile looks like. The top is um, the output we get from the spectralis. Uh, the bottom is the output we get from the densitometer. And you can see um, they both have this nice slope. Uh, the secondary peak. You can see this person peaks, second, uh, peaks out here as well um, as they do down here too. And this person has a secondary plateau, which also matches up very nicely. Um, so the conclusion I got from this study is that there's very good concordance between these devices in both measurements and in profile classification. Um, this study helps to confirm the presence of these atypical macular pigment spatial profiles. And as discussed before, um, macular pigment spatial profiles do have implications for macular pigment distribution in the back of the eye. Um, and lastly, I'd like to point out, so these are from the, the same person. Um, and you can see from the densitometer, you can see that they have a secondary peak. I mean, from the spectralis, you can see there's a secondary peak. But in the densitometer, it looks like they have a very normal spatial profile. Um, so the spectralis is a little bit better at detecting these atypical profiles. So in conclusion, the need to measure macular pigment in the person, um, now that there's this growing body of evidence to support the link between macular pigment and risk of AMD, um, we could possibly start people before they even have signs of AMD. You know, you get that patient in who has family history of AMD, but they're 40, so there's no way they're going to even show signs of it. And maybe they have a great diet. Maybe they don't smoke. Maybe they exercise regularly. You don't know how, what their macular pigment is like. I've measured tons of people that have come in. They say, oh, I eat lots of fruits and vegetables every day, but their macular pigment is suboptimal. Um, which could put them at risk for macular degeneration. So why not start before they see signs of the disease? Um, and also the influence on, on visual performance and comfort. Um, if we could help you know, young normal people that come into your offices every day who want to see better, why not see if, if there's a problem at the back of their eye, not just at the front of their eye? And that concludes my talk. Have we any questions or comments for, for the measurement of macular pigment or for Jessica? Yeah, Bill? Okay. As opposed to, say, other um, commercial macular pigment screening devices. What, what, what are your comments there? Would you, you agree? Or? I mean, we, we tested the repeatability of all of our devices, and they're all, they're all equally repeatable. Valid, um, yeah. 
Yeah, go I ahead. mean, I, I think from the point of view of Flickr, it, it's very important that you don't brand all Flickr devices as the same device because they're mm -hmm. clearly not, and reproducibility clearly differs from one device to the other. Sure. And so, um, my experience with the densitometer, this is the, the product from Professor Billy Wooten that was developed in Brown University, is that it's highly reproducible, it's highly accurate, mm -hmm. and even now in the the clinical version of that, the same stands up based on what we've seen. We've also looked at other Flickr devices that have absolutely not been so reproducible. But is there an advantage for getting as rid of as much of the subjective component as possible when you think about the sorts of patient groups you might be clinically targeting? Yeah, I mean, we, we could debate for a long time, and I'm sure Lisa and, and Matt, Randy might have a comment in terms of you know, some of the, the challenges with autofluorescence and some of the still unanswered assumptions and questions. And they they exist, exist for every device. But to, to respond to your point, yeah, I mean, the more information you can get, the better. It's clear with Flickr that we don't have 35 minutes in an optometry practice. And that's why um, you have these kind of commercial available devices that give you a snapshot of the center measure, which, as we've seen from some of actual um, Professor Hammond's work is a very good predictor of what's going on elsewhere. So there's a lot you can learn from a, a good central measure, or even in, in now it's available that you can do two central measures. So I haven't answered your question, have I? It's it's it's, it's the debate. Lisa, do you want to comment? You wanted to come in there. to make a judgment about what they're seeing. You know, you're changing the physical characteristics, they're having to make a, a judgment. And I, I think there is something that's pretty important to actually having the subject make a judgment. You know, you, you do gain information about what's going on with your person just by that fact alone. You know, as of having, as someone who's actually measured someone, you know, people literally across the lifespan from very, very young, healthy folks to folks who have Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. <laughs> I will say that it's absolutely possible to get those measurements. Oh yeah, we, we've done it, right? We've, mm -hmm. we've published work, we've collaborated on, on a project where we've been able to do it in AMD patients with, with customized Flickr. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a debate that I think is ongoing. Randy, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, well, Yeah, sure. So, so another, another point too is that uh, just because something's subjective doesn't mean it's less accurate. Yeah. I mean, you know, humans can make visual discriminations that far exceed many physical uh, equipment. So, so when you're measuring a subject who's, you know, got uh, nystagmus or a, a dense cataract, these physical measurements are near impossible. But you know, you have a brain in the back of your eye that's very good at correcting for all those distortions, and and ironically, you can get more accurate measurements. Yeah, I, I think the reason why you asked the question is I've seen what's happened in the UK with all these devices that and a lot of them don't work and there's been a lot of frustration and difficult and I understand the frustration why that's there. I mean one, one I suppose generic conclusions we can make is and I think Jessica alludes to it, is absolutely if you're interested in measuring someone over time don't interchange you know. Um, there's certain for me there's some of the reflectance the Zeiss Fijicam that I've used absolutely for me it's not measuring macular pigment at all and I, I wouldn't it's a great fundus camera. You can get very nice retinal images, but I wouldn't measure macular pigment with it. So for me, scientifically, it's still the customized flicker photometry, and we, we, spend, we have time and we spend time. The spectralis, I'm, I'm very encouraged by what I've seen with that, and um, clinically, so I think you have some options. Yeah. Well, and as you, as you sort of get used to, to working with these things, that, you know, I have to say that as someone who's been doing a lot of, of heterochromatic flicker photometry over the years, I get more information from about the about the sort of health state of my participant often that way than I think that I would with an alternative method. So as I'm looking at their sensitivity to flicker, for example, I'm getting some indication of what's going on neurologically behind the you know sort of behind the photoreceptor, as much as I am you know what's actually embedded in the photoreceptor. Yeah. Any last questions or comments? Yes, this lady here. Um, It. And a question that cropped up in the, one of the earlier sessions is how the individual is going to respond to if they are offered macular su supplements. 
um, at the end of the day, they're going to judge us whether they feel their vision is better. And to a certain extent, whether one instrument proves a scientific point or not, the very fact that they have got an input to it, and it is a psychophysical judgment, that is it, what's all important to them. And when we're acting as clinicians, that's what we're trying to glean from them. Has it improved their visual being, their visual state? It, it might be misleading scientifically, um, but it's been a judgment for us and okay. for them. Let me ask a question. How many people in this room have measured macular pigment or would consider it? Let's say, uh, if, who have measured macular pigment? I mean, so we're looking at you know, maybe a third of the audience, which if we asked this question five years ago, there would have been no hands. So I think things are changed. Awareness is good here. I think the, the, you know, the, the role of macular pigment is now being discussed. It's understood. And it, 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 there's opportunities to go and measure this now. So uh, that would be my recommendation. And we have some more, Stuart? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was something that, um, I mean, there isn't really a, a standard right now as to what an atypical macular pigment spatial profile looks like. So um, it was done by visual assessment. But as I showed here, um, most of the people in the study is either, is quite obvious they're either, oops. <coughs> like this, or like this, or like this. This was originally termed the ring-like structure, if you remember the paper um, on this. And it, it was a bit of a visual exercise. To, to answer the first part of your question, it did match the uh, previous publications in terms of, uh, of that. The significance of it, again, the, the conversation that needs to continue in terms of what, what this actually means. There's been several hypotheses. And, um, well, I think about forty percent of people have an atypical profile. I think uh, Toss Bernshot's paper suggested that it was nearly as high as fifty percent of people, right. um, which I haven't seen, and I know the lads haven't seen when when we use Flickr. What what we have to accept is with Flickr, you, you know, I mean, I'm a big Flickr fan, and I will continue to be. But you you do, you if you're not measuring at all these points, we have to make some assumptions and extrapolate lines and that. And what what was interesting was the. Jessica, this finding was that this we would have said this is a typical macular pigment profile, but when we looked at it on the spectralis, because we weren't measuring at 0.75 degrees, um, we missed that point, we missed that plateau. Right. So, I mean, the, the obvious, I'm putting on my clinical hat now, the obvious thing has to do with the concept of prescriptive carotenoids, that if we're able to measure precisely with patients with an atypical profile, we would want to supplement them with either Z-exanthin or meso z -exanthin or meso or Z, depending on what you think is going to work better there. But you would want to use a high-dose Z-exanthin isomer, right? Uh, I would suppose. My, my view doesn't change on this, and we've discussed it this morning. I think if, if, if you're on the side of the fence that supplementation is important and the objective of the exercise is to increase macular pigment, macular pigment is made up of three carotenoids. Right. Okay? My recommendation is use the tree carotenoids that it's made. So you're, cover, you're covering all bases? Yeah. Okay. Can we get your mic, Randy, just so people can benefit from your comment? Thanks. Oh, there's a man in the back that has a question, too. Okay. So th there were some, some interesting studies in the, in the 40s, actually, that used one thing about the macular pigment is that it gives rise to several entoptic phenomena. One, one's called uh, Heidinger's brushes, yeah. and another one's called uh, Maxwell's spot. So if you look at the original descriptions of Maxwell's spot, and basically how you see these things is if you destabilize the macular pigment image, then you, know, then you can suddenly see these entoptic phenomena. And in fact, a lot of people say that's why Charlemagne uh, converted to Christianity, because he saw the Heidinger's brushes, which looked like a big cross, you know? <laughs> so. Uh, but the, the appearance of the Maxwell spot looks like a, like a bullseye, presumably because of this, uh, you know, this trimodal profile. Yeah. But the trimodal profile itself has to also reflect the, the morphology of the, of the cone axons. 
You know, it's, these, uh, it's embedded in the axons, and they radiate spirally from the center. So it's, uh, it's reflecting some of that just structural, uh, the structural components of the fovea. Yeah. So that's why uh, it was also suggested early on that you could measure these distributions to sort of as, a, as an assessment of these morphological changes over time. So, so early uh, changes in the macro pigment distribution can also signal later pathology later on by, by, by looking at this, these cone changes. Good point. And we have this gentleman at the back. Uh, can existing foods in the future be modified to give the daily recommended carotenoids, but only on a low volume intake? Okay. So you like have spinach, but it just naturally contains 10 times the amount of its normal supplement. So the people are taking the subs substance without actually having to take excessive volumes of the stuff. So they're taking what's recommended, but they're not eating any more or not having to fork out any more money for supplements. So you're on about food fortification. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that, it's, it, food's I mean, manipulated. It's a whole other conference. So you, you <laughs> eat, a, eat a pepper and it contains yeah, I mean, everything a, it, that you need. So it's been modified genetically to... Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a whole other conference, you know, right. it's a whole other conversation, so I wouldn't claim So to people are getting their supplements, but they, have it, they, they, yeah. they don't realise they're getting it. I mean, we know it exists, we know you have fortified milk, you have fortified butter, you, have, you, you can do it, it can, and can have, ice cream would be a, a very good food that you could fortify with carotenoid, you know. It, and, um, but it must be a, 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 a simpler, cheaper method than actually relying on a health system to provide the supplements if they can actually put in the dietary things for people. So, Yeah, I'm sure it's, 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 it's an area of opportunity maybe. Yeah. 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 And we've, uh, Scott has a, has a question. We might finish it at that then and we'll move to the last, last lecture. Hi, thanks for your presentation. And I think you're right. Macular pigment... I mean, I've got about 120 patients who have been measuring macular pigment over seven years. When they see the change in the macular pigment, there's, not, there's only two patients that I've ever put on a supplementation that their, their, uh, their macular pigment score went down, right, for, for no reason I could find, right? Um, but for everybody else, it goes up, and it's a really powerful thing for the patient to see that because it also it is a massive problem about compliance, you know, and, and, and why people should still take stuff. They might take it and get really excited at the start, but you've got to keep that excitement going. Yeah. You know, cause I, so I think, you know, I'm a big, I mean, John, I, I'm a big believer in Flickr. You know, I think you can use it rightly. Um, but, so I think it's, it's really important. The interesting thing about the Fortify thing, I mean, what's really interesting is if you talk to GPs in this country, but, but, you know, 10% of the patients can't eat tablets because they have dysphagia. And there was a... <laughs> At one of the conferences recently, they've made a Arage 2 chocolate bar. Right? So that's crazy, because that was for the dysphagia patients. So um, I think it's fortified stuff. It's a bit another conference. But yeah. I think macular pigment, very important. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. OK. Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start um, just by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you um, this afternoon. My, I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes, half an hour, and I'm going to, my talk is a little bit different. Um, it isn't really a scientific presentation, per se. Um, my name is Dr. Mark Kirby, and I'm a scientific advisor with a commercial entity, MacuVision Europe, which makes a, a macular pigment supplement. So what I'd like to talk about is... Um, to tell you about my role, essentially tell you what I do, and how the company that I work for um, is, is taking and using all this fantastic research which we've been speaking about all day, um, and how they've consulted to this research and made a formulation based on that research. But not only that, how they were continuing to bring this research into your practice so that you can make an informed decision on what nutrition you want to recommend for your patients. I think based on, 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 on the earlier presentations, we, we now agree there is a general consensus that nutrition is very important, very important for vision. So this is something that you do need to know. Um, and what I, as I said, what I'm gonna speak about is how we're, um, we're gonna help you to do that. So let me start just by telling you about MacuVision Europe. MacuVision Europe was established in 2006. 
the goal of the company was to formulate a macular pigment supplement. That was all, to enrich macular pigment. Um, the supplement, MacuShield, is now contains lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. It's been mentioned earlier. And how the, comp the, co how the company has actually gone about marketing this is very, very exciting. Um, the tagline of the company is trust the science. Um, so what we do, essentially, instead of investing money into marketing and all that, we go to the, the other direction. We support research. Um, we support that science, and then we bring that science to you so that you can make an informed decision on, on the products you want to, um, to recommend. So that's essentially what my job is, to literally get into my car, drive to your practice, and present this research um, from researchers all over the world and, and provide it to you in a, in a digestible format so that you can understand it and you can make that informed decision. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, what qualifies me to, to come into your practice and tell you all about this stuff. Um, first thing to say is I'm not an optometrist. My background isn't really in optics. I'm a nutritionist. I studied nutrition in the University College Cork, which is in Ireland. Um, and even back then, I was um, quite interested in the bioavailability of nutrients. Um, and I did a lot of work on that, bioavailability of vitamins from, from processed meats, sausages, and things like that. And little did I know that that work was actually going to be very relevant to the work that I do today. Um, but it was after I finished that degree, I met Dr. John Nolan at the time. Um, and he was looking for a nutritionist to work on a weight loss study. He had found that people who were overweight and obese tended to, ha tended to have less macular pigment. So what he wanted to do was see if you could take those overweight people, get them to lose weight, and see if that affected their, their, their serum levels of carotenoids and their macular pigment levels. So um, I went to work at the Macular Pigment Research Group for four years, and that's where um, I completed my PhD. Um, some of the work I did there, as I said, the weight loss study, that was, that was really interesting, that was fun. Um, I was also involved in that central dip study, which has been referred to um, once or twice today. And again, that study has really, well, the follow-on study to that study has highlighted the importance of mesozeaxanthin. Again, very relevant to the role which I fulfill um, today. So let me just jump back. When MacuVision Europe were deciding to formulate a macular pigment supplement, as I said, they went to the science. And as we know, if I test any of you in this room and I examine your macular pigment, I will find three things. I will find lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. And I really enjoyed John's talk earlier on about the dietary sources. But one thing that I took from it, and I imagine everyone else took from it too, is that the amounts of these nutrients in the diet is really quite low. And what you have to also remember is that they're coming in the form of fruits and vegetables, um, which in some cases, um, the food isn't particularly bioavailable. Your body has to really work hard to get the nutrients out so that they can be absorbed and, and get to the back of your eye. So the role for supplementation here is real, and it's extremely relevant. So in formulating um, a supplement, it only seemed logical that you would include lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. And, but it goes a little further than that. Based on this, I mean, there are just two examples of some papers here, um, Max Snodderly, Richard Bone, John Landrum. These guys are really well-respected people in the world of macular pigment research. They've been doing it for many, many years. And a lot of their work, this is a particularly interesting finding, they didn't just tell us that macular pigment is composed of three carotenoids. They actually showed us the distribution of those carotenoids. We now know that that central part of the macular pigment that's my laser here. This central part of the macular pigment, the central most carotenoid, is predominantly mesozeaxanthin. And as you, so at the epicenter of your macula, it's predominantly mesozeaxanthin. This has been covered already, but I'll repeat it again. I think that's no harm. As you move away from the center, zeaxanthin becomes more predominant, and lutein is actually the predominant carotenoid in the periphery before the pigment dissipates to um, optically undetectable levels. So again, when you're going to formulate a supplement, to increase this pigment, it would seem logical that you'd include all three macular carotenoids. So they made their formulation, three macular carotenoids to enrich macular pigment. So does the research stop there? Is it OK to assume that once you take that tablet, 
that it will go into your digestive system, it will be perfectly absorbed, it will accumulate at the back of your eye, macular pigment will rapidly increase. Is it okay to make that assumption? Is it okay to assume that if you provide it in a hard tablet, that that hard tablet will have the same amount of carotenoid in 12 months from now than it does today, that it won't deplete, that it won't degrade? And the answer is no, it's not okay to make these assumptions. These have to be investigated. And that's precisely what I mean when we say that we support the science. We support researchers, independent researchers, who maintain editorial independence. We support them, they ask the research question, they conduct the trial, and they publish what they find. And then we base our supplement on what they find. This is just an example. Again, it's been mentioned a few times, and I'll mention it again, because it's a perfect example um, of the importance of asking these research questions and asking, investigating your product, basically. The atypical profile, I really like those pictures that Jessica had of the, of the mountain and, and the volcano and stuff, because it's, um, it, uh, it's better than my images, basically. But um, um, what, what, what that study highlighted, I'm not going to go into it again, um, and what the follow-on study, uh, John's study, what, um, what it essentially highlighted was that if you give this individual, sorry, this individual here, a lutein-based supplement without any mesozeaxanthin, nothing happens. You don't rebuild that profile in a period of six months. Whereas if you give them all three macular carotenoids, in, in a period of six months, it not only increases the macular pigment to what we, I think we call it in the paper a clinically desirable macular pigment spatial profile. It not only does that, but it also enriches macular pigment right across the entire spatial profile. This was another interesting paper, and again, it was a paper which is of particular relevance to our product. Um, I really like what John said earlier on, actually, about the three macular carotenoids. They're like brothers and sisters. They hang around together. They're found in the same, they're happy together. They're found in the same foods. And this study really highlighted that. It's um, essentially what it found was, to make quite a complex study really, really simple, if you take a test tube full of 10 mils of lutein, you take another one, 10 mils of zeaxanthin, a third one, 10 mils of mesozeaxanthin, but then you take a fourth one that's actually a mixture of all three at the same total concentration. The one with the mixture has a far greater antioxidant capacity than any of the other three. So again, like John said, they're happier together. They work better together. There is some sort of a synergistic relationship there, which, which merits further study, absolutely. But it's very, very interesting. And again, if you're going to make a, a, a nutritional supplement to increase the macular pigment, these are the other things you must consider. So this is the range. This is, this is essentially what you'll see on the shelf. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the product of consulting that research. Um, the reason I put this one up is because there's a, a vegetarian option available now. The other ones were available in um, the, the capsule shell as a bovine gelatin. Um, so in order to make it suitable for vegetarians, the new product, I think the shell is made of, made of carrageenan. So it's, actually, it's, it's perfectly suitable. The, the contents um, is the exact same. Then about a month and a half ago, things got really, really interesting. Because as John and Stephen um, have just eloquently presented, the finding of ARITS 2 had huge implications for this industry. What it essentially showed was, I mean, Stephen's covered it really, really well, but what it essentially showed is that you provide the macular carotenoids in addition to these extra nutrients, um, vitamins and minerals, you can have a real impact on age-related macular degeneration, especially in people who have poor diets. Um, which is huge, very, very important. And again, it had huge, huge implications for us as a commercial entity, because we had to respond to this. And we did respond to it. And the next slide shows you what we're going to do. Um, MacuShield Gold is, it's in the factory at the moment. It's being produced. But it's being produced in response to the ARIDS-2 trial. Now, um, I won't say it's the exact same, because what we have in our one is our original MacuShield, our lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. Mesozeaxanthin was not included in ARIDS-2. But based on what you've heard today, it is quite safe to conclude that the carotenoids work best together. So the addition of mesozeaxanthin really provides a fortified ARIDS-2 formulation. Um, and this, this will be available in, in the coming weeks. Um, start of September, I believe. But again, it highlights the fact that you have to listen to the research. You have to follow what the research says, and this is the product of that. So 
is that the end of it? Is that the end for original Mackie Shield? I, I had a very long conversation on John um, on the phone with John about Arids 2, um, and essentially what he said was, whenever AMD is in the conversation, you have to go to the Arids 2 data. It's the best data we have, so you have to recommend the Arids 2 formulation. So, what happens with the original Mackey Shield? Does it, is it, does it disappear? No, it doesn't disappear, because what we saw in the first lecture, and I, I believe in the next lecture, Professor Hammond's lecture, we are really lucky to have him, and I'm looking forward to it, He's going to speak about the role of macular pigment for visual performance. And I think there's a sports slant on it. So that, that's going to be really, really interesting. But essentially, what we know is that if you enrich your macular pigment, one, we know you can enrich it using all three macular carotenoids quite rapidly. And if you do, vision gets better. This is just a whole list of research papers um, which supports essentially what I just said. Improvements in terms of contrast sensitivity, photo stress recovery, vision under glare conditions. So that is precisely what our Mackey Shield, our, our three carotenoid Mackey Shield, is, is, is targeting, improving vision, whether that person has, um, has AMD or not. So this is kind of cool, and I wanted to show it to you. This was a conference which we went to in Chamonix um, in February. And it was a conference, a guy called uh, Nick Dash, um, he's, a, he's an optom, um, came up with this idea to get together a whole bunch of optometrists from around Europe, key opinion leaders, to discuss the role um, of visual excellence. And we were invited along to speak on the role of nutrition in achieving visual excellence. Um, and he chose a high glare environment to do that. Um, that's just some, some comments there from, from the guys who are in attendance. You might recognize some of the names. But what we have done as a result of this, um, we've produced this uh, discussion report. Um, and I think it's going to be really, really useful for all of you. In fact, I think you all have a copy of it in your, in your packs. Um, essentially, it, it presents, it, it, it details quite simply the role of nutrition for visual excellence, all about this light filtration, light scatter, all that. Um, what was discussed, what people's opinions were, um, and it's summarized in a, in a, in a four-page booklet. So I just wanted to show you that. I thought that was kind of cool. This is another thing I wanted to show you, um, Mackey Shield and Precision Vision. So we're in very, very early talks, but um, we're talking with BALPA, and that's the, the British Pilots Association. Um, and they're very, very interested in this. Pilots need to have good vision, and they operate in an extremely high-glare environment. Um, um, so we're, in, we're talking with them. They're very interested in examining the role of nutritional supplementation for their pilots to give them better vision. So this, as I said, it's, very, it's early days yet, but this could be the first example of nutrition for vision becoming commonly accepted by people who need really good vision, pilots, but surgeons, golfers, whoever. This could be the first real example of that. So I thought that was um, worth mentioning. Now, this is unusual. This, 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 these next two slides are my last two slides. We're added in at the last minute, and I really have no place at all at a scientific conference, but you're all business people, um, and I thought you might be interested in it, so I included it. We have a database um, at MacuVision Europe. We hold a database of about 1,500 or so um, people who regularly take MacuShield, who take MacuShield. We have their, they give us their phone numbers and their email addresses. Um, and we, our, market re, our marketing department conducted market research, and we asked them some questions. Um, so this question, why were you initially interested in MacuShield? I thought the, the, the response was quite interesting. Um, so you can see there, my optician advised me to take it. It just shows there really is an awareness, um, which surprised me, actually. I didn't think the awareness was that high amongst the public. But this would suggest it is. I really like this 23.5% on the end as well. I needed, I wanted to enhance my eye health. Again, it shows that the role of nutrition for vision is becoming more common, let's say. But finally, this was, this was really interesting. Um, so we asked them, and it, I think there was a lady there asking in the last, this is quite relevant to the, the, the comment you made. We asked them, did you think your vision got better um, after a month? And remember, this is, this is subjective data, but it's still, it's interesting because it relates to how the patient actually feels. Um, after a month, they said, no, my, my vision didn't get better. After three months or more, 
asked the same question. Did you notice an improvement in your vision after taking Maxwell for three months or more? About 79% of people said yes. Now, some of those said yes when I was driving at night. Yes, when I'm out in a bright sunny day. There were subcategories, but very, very interesting nonetheless. And I thought you might appreciate that. And really, that's all I have to say. So thank you very much for listening. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thanks again.